to inform, to make sure we have a citizenry that knows about politics and policy. And we're very grateful for Sutherland for being a partner, helping us do this over the years. And today we're excited to hear from Congressman Christopher as part of the 2023 Congressional Series. So we are going to start with Representative Stewart, who served in the second district since 2013. He will be ending his time in service in Congress soon, and we're excited to hear about his reflections, what he thinks is going to be happening next. And um, so Congressman Stewart will start us with um, Rick Larson, the president and CEO of Sutherland Institute. And then following that conversation, we'll move to a moderated panel with Professor Jim Curry from the University of Utah, Christine Cook Fairbanks, with Sutherland's, who is Sutherland's Education Policy Fellow, and I feel like I'm forgetting someone. Is that our panel? That sounds like a very wonderful panel. Uh, I, I know who I'm forgetting, our moderator, Nick Dunn, the Vice President of Strategy and Communications at Sutherland Institute. So with that, I will turn the time to Rick and to Congressman Stewart. Thank you for joining us. We'll get perched on our stools. Good to be with you, Rick. Thank good, you. Good to be with you. It's not lost on me. We won't get to do it, this again in this context. So yeah, probably not. Thank the you very family, much. Family, freedom, opportunity, responsibility, right? Not a bad list. Yeah, that's pretty good. It should, it should be helpful. There's a lot to talk about. Can we jump right in? Sure. So five terms in the United States yeah. House of Representatives. Five and a half. Five and a half. Five and a half. Let's see it a while. Are, are you clapping because they're glad I'm leaving? Is that what it is? <laughs> oh, we, well, we will assume that. That was out of respect. <laughs> um, I want to start at the highest level, and then we'll get down to some specific things you've done and, and some specific advice you would offer. But let's, let's start first talking about Congress. Yeah. You've seen a lot of things in, in this period of time. I'm wondering if you've seen changes. How has the body changed? How has debate changed? changed um yeah so i've actually thought about this a little bit and i've and i occurred to me really early that things were different and then they've gone you know at a much faster pace even more and more different now so uh when i decided to run for congress i had never been involved with politics i'd been a military officer i'd been a small businessman i was mostly a writer at the time and some of my family had been in politics but you know, they'd worked on staff and other things. None of them were elected. Uh, so when I decided to run, I had no idea what I was doing. <clears throat> but a good friend of our family, Jim Hansen, who some of you will remember, he was a previous congressman from, from not the second district because the districts have changed, but generally from a lot of my district. Um, I called him and, and he and another former governor, Norm Bangeter, endorsed me. And they, they were, again, friends and very helpful and uh, I kept in contact with both of them until they passed away. But when I was first elected, I didn't have a, a kind of a s support group around me. I hadn't, as I said, been in politics. So I didn't know a lot of people who had been. And so there are a few people that I could talk to who I thought could help me. And, and, and those that were those people, I relied a lot on them. So I would call Jim and I would say, hey, Jim, this is going on. And, you know, this is, this is happening and the speaker is doing this and the Democrats are doing this. And and I would try to talk through, you know, and see what he thought. And and as as we discussed, he would give me his advice. And after about the second or third phone call, I realized nothing he tells me makes any sense. And the reason was, is Congress was so different than when he was in Congress. And it had only been like 10 years. But he would tell me things and it just didn't make any sense at all, or it just wasn't even a possible option. And and the, in the intervening time, uh, in 2010, the Freedom Caucus was was formed, and they became a very powerful uh, voice in Congress. And then you had, you know, uh, different groups on the on the progressive side who were, you know, doing much the same thing, creating these, you know, coalescing around these different uh, causes. And you know, bottom line of this is, it changed a lot from Jim Hansen's uh, experience, which, as I said, eight or ten years before me. And it's changed as much or more in the 10 years that I've been there. Uh, the worst job in the universe is to be a Republican Speaker of the House. 
And I really mean that. I mean, there's no way in the world I would ever to take that job. Uh, you look at John Boehner. He was uh, what they called a young gun. He was one of these guys who came to Congress as a radical, as kind of the Freedom Caucus guy. And in my view, and John Boehner is a good friend of mine, and I think he's a really decent person and a very conservative leader, but he left that job diminished. Paul Ryan. When I was first running, people would ask me, what do you want to do if you're elected? And I said, because the reason I was running at the time, that one of the primary issues at, the, at that time, 2012, was our debt and our spending. And uh, they, so they'd say, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to go into Paul Ryan's office and shake his hand and say, I'm with you, brother. I want to help. I want to be in this fight because Paul's fight was debt and spending. Uh, and yet Paul, and he was very, very well respected. In fact, he was kind of compelled to be the speaker. He genuinely didn't want the job. He was smart enough not to want it. Uh, but Paul left there diminished. Kevin McCarthy, a good friend of mine, uh, I worry that he'll leave their mission. It's just an impossible job. And I think that's a good indicator of how it is, it is changed. It's been fractured. You have voices on both extremes that have become very influential. They aren't, they're not in the, in the uh, majority, but they still have enormous influence. And, uh, and I'm afraid that's just the day we live in. It's a d very, very divisive time. I was talking with Gary, my a uh, district director, as we were driving up, we were talking about the upcoming election, and it worries worries me a lot what happens in our nation in the next 18 months in these very divided times. I'd like your reaction to a concept. Those in the think tank world are constantly studying, assessing, defining these trends. And there's a definition that, that has evolved um, out of some good friends at American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C. I'd love your reaction to this. There are those who say that Congress has shifted from a formative institution where its members aspired to behave, uh, to earn the respect that a member of Congress should have, that it has shifted to a performative platform, which implies people are running for office who may or may not fully understand the job, but seek it to perform, to further an agenda. Does that ring true with you? Yeah, it certainly rings true. The thing that I don't know if, if whether it's more true now than it used to be. I mean, I can't go back 100 years ago because there were some people who were, you know, very public, very radical, you know, who, you know, are some of our founding fathers you could describe that way. Do I think it's worse? Well, in my experience, it certainly is. Is it the worst it's ever been? Hard for me to say. I'm not a historian and it's hard for someone I think to measure that it's a very subjective measure, but a couple of things in, implied in the question or in the question that I think are worth, worth addressing. You said they come to Congress, they don't really know what they're doing. Well, that's true of everyone. There's no one who comes to Congress and understands the job. Uh, some understand it better than others. There are some people, and I, I won't tell you who it is, although if you guys were imagine, I think you could figure out and narrow it down to a couple of people. But there's a there's a guy, and he's actually a really decent person. I really quite like him. He was I didn't not the first person I reached out to when he came to Congress. He's been there like six years or something. Uh, but he's very very public. He's on the media all the time, and he says a lot of things that are actually just kind of silly. They're not very thoughtful, but in my opinion. Uh, but I was talking to him, and he and I said, you know, we were talking. Oh, you're actually in the green room at Fox, and we were talking about being on media. And I, and he said to me, this is the reason I'm here said, my sister was a producer for, for Fox, and, and she kind of helped me get started. She, he says, this is the reason I'm here. I'm a voice. I'm a message. Uh, you know, I'm not here to, you know, be really deep into the weeds on legislation. I'm here to talk on, on media. So, you know, do I think that's the role of a member of Congress? Well, it's, a, it's part of it, but it's not the thing and not the reason we should be there, I don't think. But for some people it is, and I think that's, to use your word, performative. Uh, but I really believe to be, those people have a role, but to really be an effective member of Congress, you've got to be willing to work on legislation. You've got to be willing to make friends, including friends who you don't agree with, because the only way you move something through Congress is to have friends on the other side of the aisle who will support you. Uh, it's, it's much more than just public speaking or being on, on the media or trying to raise money by saying something crazy. I mean, I could be on the media virtually eight hours a day if I would do one thing. Be a Republican who, who criticized Republicans. If you're willing to do that, they'll give you a huge platform. I could raise a lot of money doing that. But I, I don't think that's an effective member of Congress if that's the only thing you're doing. We've seen some interesting uh, media moments 
um, out of the House in particular. You think of the Speaker vote and a few things that have gone on, division, then division within the party. I think most people would like to know and, and possibly be reassured or alarmed by the answer. But it, is it any different when the cameras are off and, and the doors are closed among members of Congress? Is the relationship better than it appears? Yeah, it is. Uh, and I almost hate to admit that because it shows you that there's a, not a lot of honesty in our public discourse. It, it, but uh, the Appropriations Committee is a really good example of that. Very powerful committee. goes back you know, to the original Congress or nearly. Uh, so it's one of the original committees. And its responsibility is every dollar that's spent in federal government has to go through the Appropriations Committee. So we touch every sector of government. There's not a piece of government that we don't have influence on and ultimately say whether we're going to fund it or not. Uh, point being, it's a powerful historical committee. If you were to come to our markups, these are the 12 bills where we sit in a room much like this with the 60 members, and these markups may take eight hours, they may take 18. But at the end of the end of that session, after this is after hundreds and hundreds of hearings, we now have to mark up the bill. If you were to listen to that debate, those 12 hours or 14 hours, you would think that we're ready to go to war with one another uh, because it's very partisan. This is the opportunity primarily for the member or for the uh, minority. And remember, I was in the minority just a few years ago, so I know what this is like. It's the one opportunity for us to get up and say, this is what we think and this is what we want to do. And it comes across as very partisan. Uh, for a nonpartisan committee, for a committee that is viewed as being less partisan than many others. But then when we walk out, you kind of, you really do say, hey, uh, John, how you doing? And, you know, there is... It, it, it doesn't translate into the personal relationships because there is more uh, friendliness. And, and part of that is you just, a lot of people feel like you just got to be decent with people, even if you think they're crazy, even if you think that they're, what they're doing is just, just fundamentally wrong. Uh, but part of it is that some of it is, to use your previous question, kind of performative. This is my chance to talk to my constituents and say how bad Republicans are. Or this is my chance to say how bad the Democrats are but they really don't believe it. In fact, I made that point once. I said, you guys say things that you really don't believe. You really don't think that Republicans hate all women, or you really don't believe that Republicans are racist. I mean, they really don't. Now, maybe one or two of them, but I mean, if you listen to them, that's what you would think that they all thought. And I think that's probably a good example of what you see is not always what you get. Well, let's follow up on that because the public, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting to gauge public opinion and perception and people are concerned. They, uh, in fairly large numbers, they, you call they should as dysfunctional. That's right. Well, are they viewing it correctly? Is there a path to improvement? Yeah. What What should the average voter do rather than wring their hands watching the evening news? What What yeah. should they be doing? So, I mean, what you do, and everyone hates this answer, but it's the answer. You get involved. You vote for people that you support. You vote for school board members that you support. You vote for governors. And you vote for congressmen and senators. I mean, that at the end of the day, Congress reflects America. And and that's an unfortunate fact and uncomfortable, but it's true, especially the House, because every two years I have to sit in a room with people like this and convince the majority plus one or, or half of them plus one to vote for me. And and there's an enormous difference between the House and the Senate than the fact that we are up for re-election every two years. Some people have suggested to me, maybe we should make it every four years. That way you're not campaigning all the time. And I'm like, nope. Absolutely not. We need to be in touch with the people. And the only way you do that is if you compel us to go before the voters every two years and make that case. Uh, so um, what was the question? I, I got diverted there for just a minute. Well, I'm, just, I'm just curious what we, you would say to a public observing a Congress that they have decided is dysfunctional, yeah. but they don't feel like they have any power. Okay. To correct. Yeah. So two things I want to say on that. Number one is, you, is it's really pretty simple, but it seems simplistic and like not very effective, but you got to vote for and support good people. But the other thing is, is our founding fathers intended the, for this to be, uh, you know, chaotic, uh, you know, freedom is difficult. Uh, they wanted it to be slow. They didn't want us to lurch from one policy to another in dramatic changes based on one election. The, uh, and I'll give you a really good example of that. Uh, one of the things I'm most proud that we did was create the National Suicide Hotline number, the 988 number. This was a bill that literally will save millions of lives. It's already by one study by USA Today has saved well over 180,000 lives. It hasn't even been implemented for a year. Didn't cost a lot of money not partisan, you know, who, who's not for suicide prevention, right? We had hundreds of Democrats co-sponsor that. Still took me five years 
to move that through Congress and through the FEC. Our founding fathers wanted that to be that way. They wanted it to be thoughtful and deliberate. And that's in the House. The Senate's even more so. So, but that frustrates a lot of people. And so their presumption is sometimes, well, Congress is slow, therefore it's dysfunctional. Not always. Sometimes that slowness is actually the function of Congress. It's the way our founding fathers intended it. I think it's a very important point, especially, you know, you can, you can have extremes within, you can have older generations longing for a day when things were better, whether they really were or not, the yeah. memory says they were better. Then you've got a younger generation who quite understandably doesn't know what to think when they watch how things are working, but the call is for engagement, right? It's to become part of the process. Yeah. And I would, I would make two observations on that if I could. Number one is, if you want to see partisan, really bitter partisan rhetoric, look at what Ab things were said about Abraham Lincoln. And when I say things are said about him, I'm not talking about from Southern leaders. I'm talking about his own friends in many cases. And, and the, the partisanship and the bitterness rhetoric of politics is not new to us. It's, it's clearly been with us again since the Founding Fathers. Uh, but the thing that the thing that worries me a little bit is that a lot of that rhetoric was uh, was centered in the in politics and among politicians. I don't feel like uh, Americans felt a lot of that. Uh, you know, I don't think in the 1870s someone asked, "Are you a Republican or Democrat?" Uh, nearly so much. It worries me now that it's much more in our society. It's much more beyond just the body politic. And, and even to the point where some people appear to be self-sorting as you see people leave certain states and move to other states. And, uh, you know, the polling that shows that I wouldn't be friends with someone who was a Democrat because I'm Republican, that worries me a lot. I think that is new. I did, that didn't used to be the case. Not in my lifetime, for sure. Uh, even in very divided times, that's something that's different in our society now. I agree with that observation, and it, and it doesn't trend well if you think about where that's going. Let's talk about, you touched on on an accomplishment and, a, and you've had many over a, a long career uh, in public service. What jumps out, what would you highlight uh, as maybe the, the three or four things you are most proud of in, in addition to the suicide prevention line? Um, you know, I should give that some thought because uh, people are going to ask me. Uh, obviously, one of the things I'm, very proud of his work we did on the intelligence uh, committee. It's a it's a very important committee. It's a select committee, so it's very small, uh, and the members on it are really the, the most extraordinary members of Congress. But the problem is on that you can't talk about much of the work we do, uh, so uh, hard to come home and brag. Uh, but I remember, uh, as an example, uh, during when we were you know, really more involved with the Middle East and Syria particularly. I remember being there. Now, I wasn't in Syria because a member of Congress could not go to Syria. But we were there in the region uh, and very, very close. Um, and I remember it, it was a program that no American had any idea about. It was an expensive program, a billion dollars a year. So it wasn't a small program. And, uh, and I, my, my job was to go there and decide, are we going to continue to fund this? Is this, are we getting our money's worth? Is this the outcome we're hoping for? And I actually felt tremendous responsibility, not just to the billion dollars. I mean, billion dollars in today's world, I mean, that's pocket change, right? Uh, but it was more to the fact that if we, what direction we went was going to impact lives and, and it was people were going to die regardless. And if we didn't get the right decision, many more people were going to die. Uh, so that kind of work is, is something I'm, I'm very proud of as well. And then finally, um, you know, it's been 50 years since Utah's had a member on the Appropriations Committee, and we desperately need that 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 presence. And uh, so the ability to fund priorities, including priorities here, that uh, that I think look, the federal government's going to spend money. Let us decide how it's spent. I'm not advocating for spending more money. I'm advocating for let us decide how the money is spent in a way that makes sense. Uh, I think I'm very, very proud of that. And then finally, this is kind of a surprising one. On my wall, I don't have all the legislation we've sponsored, but we've got plaques for like maybe 12 or 14 of the, of the most important. One of them is one that says rejected. Uh, and it was a bill that I thought this makes no sense at all. We should 
do everything we can to stop this. And a bill that we thought uh, uh, was probably almost certainly going to pass, we were able to stop. And I thought, that's good. Sometimes it's not just pushing good ideas. Sometimes it's stopping really bad ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I'm watching the clock. Am I okay on time for those? Watch? Okay. I want to make, you, you made a decision recently, which is leading to um, this conclusion, the conclusion of this phase of your career. And it's a decision that had everything to do with family. I mentioned Congress as a formative institution, but I don't want to let time run out without giving you the chance to talk about family as a formative institution in this nation. I know you're involved with the Respect for Marriage Act. Um, a lot of these things become partisan in implementation, but at the core of that, there were principles that had everything to do with the family as a formative institution in our country. Yeah. Talk a little bit about how you see that going forward and, and and the opportunity for families to actually form the future citizens and those attitudes that, that will keep us free. Yeah. Faith, family, freedom. Right. Opportunity, responsibility. Yeah. All of them are all of them together. Look, this will this will sound simplistic and it shouldn't be controversial, but in some cases it is. Uh but it shouldn't be. But I would argue and I could I think effectively argue with facts and, and figures that show this one thing is really clear. The vast majority of the societal problems that we're experiencing right now can be traced back to the foundation of the family and the diminishing or the weakening of family in our society. And uh, you pick a problem, not in every case, but in many of them, you can go back and see that that is the root cause of it. And you know the thing that's sad about that, Rick, is the root cause, so we have problems, but you have to remember those problems create unhappiness and stress and disappointment in people's lives. It leads to people being less opportunity to be happy and living fulfilling lives. So protecting the family. Uh, and, and, you know, as, as a military member, uh, a guy who, you know, my, my family and I served for a long time in the Air Force and before he came to Congress, um, the 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 support of the family for people who try to serve and how important that is. I mean, there's so many different reasons why the family is important. But if you care about society and if you care about our future, you have to care about the family and you have to try to support the family. Uh, we had a Congressional Achievement Awards uh, thing in my office earlier this morning where these really bright young uh, couple of young women had won this award and I was able to give them their award and their medal. And you look at the things they're accomplishing, and when I ask them, what are you looking forward to? And as they're answering this question, in your life, as they're answering this question, I think how important it is for us to protect our culture and our society and our government so that they can live happy lives that they expect and that they deserve. Uh, but there's so much to that. I mean, that's a question we could answer, we could talk about for hours. But, uh, One of the elements of the question that I, that I find interesting is, it seems, I just sat in an interesting roundtable discussion this morning, um, where the group around the table could have easily identified points of disagreement or common principles, and we immediately jumped to common principles. It was a very fruitful conversation. What advice would you give um, to the next congressman from your district or anyone aspiring to run for office? Have, what have you learned about how to take the partisanship out of the debate and get to the principle, or is that possible? Is that advisable? Yeah. Uh, so good news and bad news on that, I think. I hate to give bad news, uh, but, uh, you know, 10 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 100 years ago, we were arguing about important things, but we were arguing about what's the right corporate tax rate or, you know, what's the right uh, formula to determine, you know, welfare benefits or you know, a number of things, important things, not just about the economy, but about national security and you know, how much do we support NATO, et cetera. Important issues, but they weren't ex existential issues to us. And we're debating now principles and issues that define us entirely as a nation. And we, we weren't debating those in the same way before. Uh, I mean, we're really at a crossroads in many ways of deciding who, what, who we are and what we believe as people. And because that's true, those they're very difficult to to uh, find common ground or to compromise on those things. For example, 
Uh, hey, if you want, I'll use it. It's a, it's a simple example. It's not the best, but it works. If you want to talk about the right corporate tax rate, I'm happy to compromise with you on that. But if you want to talk about what it means to be a man or a woman, or if you want to talk about what religious liberty, what relig- what liberties are you willing to give up in order to protect religious liberty? You know, those things are much, much more difficult to compromise on. And at some point you have to say there can be no compromise on this. If you actually feel like the outcome is to destroy who we are as a people or a culture. So the bad news is, is I think we're going to have divisive uh, conversations about this as we've had for the last half generation. I don't see those being resolved in the, by the weekend. We're probably going to have some, some difficult conversations about that. The good news is you can work your way through those. We did. We have. The best example, obviously, the creating of our, of our constitution of the government, they were deciding these existential questions as well. And they found a way to compromise. I and mean, if you say compromise, here's a good example. How do you compromise on whether an African-American slave is a person or not, right? That's a hard thing to have a conversation about. But our founding fathers had to do that. And they found a way to do it. They didn't find the solution, but they found a way to get to the solution in the, in the near future. Um, again, very emotional debate about that kind of an issue. The, 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 uh, imagine the debate over the Civil War. And what we found a way to get, we're obviously in a, in a horrible outcome, but we still came back together as a nation. So if anyone tells me that these issues are too tough, we can't find answers. I think that's nonsense. We've demonstrated as, as, a, as a country we can. But if anyone were to say to me they're going to be simple, I think that's equally nonsense. It's going to be difficult. We're seeing the difficulty of it. But I'm optimistic that we can, and we have to try. We owe it to those two young girls who were in my office this morning. We owe it to my kids and my grandkids. We owe it to them to do everything we can to have a positive outcome here. And I find too many people are just kind of throwing up their hands, truly throwing up their hands and saying, you know, it's just too hard. We're not going to be able to fix this. It's not true. We can't fix it. Often our, our legacies are defined by, by those around us rather than anything we'd like to intentionally seek. And I don't, this is not a wake. This is a kind of a portion of a, yep. of a career and yep. you yet do many important things. But as you look back on your time um, in the House of Representatives, what would you like to most be remembered for? And what do you take away from that experience that keeps you hopeful about the future of this nation? What would I most like to be remembered for? Mm. So um, I did not want to lead Congress. Um, and we, and after 11 years, I was in a position where we had real, real influence, partly because of my seniority, partly because of my committees and their friendships and relationships I'd made. Um, and I certainly didn't want to leave Congress in the middle of a term, but, uh, I think most people know my wife had a stroke and about a year ago and it's, uh, you know, we tried to work through it for a year and doctor said, give it a year. Uh, but we reached a point where I realized it just wasn't fair to her any longer for me to be gone all the time. And in Congress, you're gone all the time. But then my responsibilities on intelligence, I mean, I was gone all the time. I mean, I, in just the last six months, I've been overseas many, many times. And I realized it wasn't fair to her. So very awkward, very difficult decision, but we had to announce I'm going to retire and I'm not going to finish up my turn. I did not know how people would accept that. I expected kind of a worst case scenario. I had some people tell me, oh, you're going to be damaged goods. You know, no one's going to want to associate with you. I thought, well, maybe. I hope that's not true. But I have had hundreds of people reach out from around the country, and they all said the same thing. It's just getting to the answer. They all said, hey, you've been a great congressman. We're going to miss you. You know, things you would expect. But almost to the person, they said something that I didn't expect. They said, I want you to know I'm proud of you for making this decision. When we say we put family first, only a couple times in our lives is that tested. And that's the thing that I think I would like to be remembered for. Someone who said he loved his family would put his family first, and when he had to, he did. Uh, and I, and I, that, that experience has been very gratifying to me. It's really kind of uplifted my faith and belief in people, that they would realize that I didn't do this for selfish purpose. I did it because your family sometimes has to be your priority. And uh, I didn't anticipate that, but I think that's the one thing that I would like to be remembered for. Someone who believes, loved his country, loved his family, and put them as priority. 
I would echo that. And, and having had interactions with you over the last several years, you you have always demonstrated um, those principles. And this was a test. And 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 by the way, I think most people would do that. I don't think I'm exceptional in that way at all. I, I would tell people all the time, you would do the same. Thing. People would. Most people would do the same. Thing. Yeah. Fill in the blank, and then and then we'll let you get off this stool. Um, I am hopeful in the future of the United States because... I, I think about that all the time. I know the answer because God cares about this country, whether we like it or not. And some people don't like it. Some people resent it, and it's not easy for us. But whether we like it or not, we are the glue that holds the world together. If the United States stumbles, the world crumbles underneath us. And that's true from an intelligence perspective. It's true from national security. It's true from trade. It's true from diplomacy. It's true from everything that matters. Everyone in the world looks to us for leadership, whether we like it or not. And, uh, and God knows that, and God still cares about this country. We don't get to decide when it's the end of the country. We don't get to decide when it's the end of the world. God gets to decide that. And until he's decided that, we have a responsibility to work and to fight and to try to protect our country. And I'm hopeful because I still think the United States has an enormously important role in the world. And, uh, and I wrote a book called Seven Miracles Saved America, the premise of it being God cares about our country enough to make provide miracles in our past. I think that's hopefully true of the future as well. Beautiful. Good note to end on. Thank you for your service. Appreciate you appreciate the Sutherland and, and Hinckley, two great organizations. We're very proud to be associated with you and keep working. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.